Time to take a trip down memory lane and relive the glory days of professional wrestling in the Dallas-Fort Worth Metroplex and beyond. I'm John Renton with my review, Tales from the Territories, World Class Championship Wrestling, Wrestling's Lone Star Legacy. Let me know your thoughts on this show in the comments, please. And yes, so many pieces have been done about the very, very popular meteoric rise and spectacular fall of World Class Championship Wrestling. Headed by Fritz Von Erich. Starring the Von Erich boys, the Von Erich Freebird rivalry, and so many other great talents that came through that territory that was really, really hot for a bit. And boy, that fall. Goodness gracious, that fall. I mean, there was Heroes of World Class Championship Wrestling, a tremendous documentary that is available on YouTube that came out just before the World Class Championship Wrestling tape library was sold to WWE. They did their own documentary piece. And then Dark Side of the Ring did three pieces on World Class Championship Wrestling Towns, Bruiser Brody, Gino Hernandez, and Kevin Von Erich and the Von Erich family. So it was really nice to actually hear from the various panel members here, even though one kind of made me scratch my head, but I kind of understood it once they got into it. This is a pretty good episode. Yeah, it tread a little bit of familiar ground because so many of these stories have been told. There were some cool Terry Bam Bam Gordy stories <laughs> that I can't wait to dive into, but this is one of the better episodes. I like to told a pretty good timeline and just let people tell how wild and crazy World Class was and the far reach that it had. I mean, it was amazing. They were popular in Israel. They were popular in other countries, popular all over the country. If only Fritz had decided to take the TV national. If only he had. You had to wonder what would have happened maybe if, if David Von Erich hadn't passed away. Who knows? World Class Championship Wrestling could have gone on into the night. It would have been interesting to see how much further they could have gone if they could have exploded in popularity, even though that led to the biggest you know, house that they had, the biggest gate they had, you do have to wonder if David Von Erich could have been running things because Fritz Von Erich was ready to step away. It's a real uh, a tremendous series of what-ifs, but nevertheless, <coughs> World Class got tons of attention. Fans loved them. They were hot in pockets, but really in Dallas, Reunion Arena, Sportatorium. The Von Erich boys, Carrie, Kevin, David, not necessarily in that order, were revered. Even Mike, though Mike, you could argue, probably should have never been in wrestling and probably only wanted to do it because his brothers did. That's just my interpretation, watching him in the ring. And Chris Von Erich, who really tried hard, but, you know, had his, <clears throat> had his health issues from the asthma medication and all that. So the Von Erichs being over like God. Speaking of the Von Erichs, Kevin Von Erich was on the panel. Of course he was going to be, because he's the only Von Erich that was around at that point. He does have two sons that still, or that wrestle on occasion and are very good. Jimmy Garvin, uh, Brian Adias, that was nice to hear from Brian Adias. David Manning, at no surprise. I wish they had gotten Bill Mercer, but I know Bill Mercer, if he is still alive, is nearing 100 and probably didn't want to travel and Chavo Guerrero Jr. Now it makes sense because Chavo Sr., a.k.a. Chavo Classic, wrestled in world class. So it makes sense why Chavo Jr. would have maybe chimed in. It was still a bit of an odd inclusion. I think you could have not had Chavo Jr. in there. I don't really think he... I mean, I kind of get he was like, well, hey, what was this like? What was this like? I mean, he does have, you know, a legacy in wrestling. He's wrestled for a number of years. I just still think that if he hadn't been included, I don't think it would have been, I, I don't think anything would have been amiss. The Sportatorium, how I believe Gary Hart referred it as to, you know, one, it's like a shithole, but it looked great on TV, but it was an old tin shed where the roof leaked and all the old stuff. Because there was a fire at the Sportatorium, I think sometime in the 50s, and instead of rebuilding all of it, they just put something down the middle of it, and then there were rats and there were other stuff and everything, but it looked great on TV. And the ring was hard as a goddamn rock. According to the guys, the TV presentation, the musical intros, even though other wrestlers had done musical intros before, not to that volume. The way they shot it, the tremendous camera work, the extra cameras, the lights, all that. It looked great. It was great television. Looking back on that stuff, looking back even at um, you know Reunion Arena, but looking at the Sportatorium TV, and I wish they would put the entire thing on the cock, on, uh, you know, the WWE, and since they had the whole library, they could put it all on there. It would be nice to see the entire timeline, but yeah, it looked great. It was tight in on the action. They did the vignettes, the pre-tapes, all that stuff. The personality profiles, as they called them. 
I was a little bit disappointed Iceman King Parsons wasn't part of this. Maybe they couldn't... That that would have been better, actually, if they had gotten him to be part of it instead of Chavo, since Iceman King Parsons was a part of some pretty big angles, including that hair, that hair match with Buddy Roberts. And Buddy Roberts got mentioned quite a bit here, but yeah, various wrestlers like Stan Stasiak, Ox Baker, Blackjack Mulligan, Terry Funk, Jim, uh, Johnny Valentine, uh, the Great Kabuki, talents that got their start there, Dingo Warrior, oh, yes, the future Ultimate Warrior, Hulk Hogan, fuck the Ultimate Warrior, by the way, I'm glad he's dead, King Kong Bundy, 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 you big fat piece of uh, good old Ernie lad, god, I wish I could find that video again, Rick Rude, Texas Red, who would later uh, go on to be The Undertaker, <laughs> even El Santo wrestled there, when he was in his 60s or 70s. It is El Santo. Goddamn El Santo. I mean, if not the greatest, one of the greatest mass superstars ever. Probably the greatest. I mean, I couldn't even talk. I couldn't even, you know, begin to encompass the tremendous legacy and the lore of El Santo. Just, you know, how revered he was. The movies, the comics. The wrestling, you know, just how big of a star he was. And not just in Mexico. He was pretty big. <clears throat> Otherwise, like, people were more than aware of him, especially in pockets in Texas. And El Santo was revered. And it was just kind of cool to know that he wrestled in world class. I found out some things I didn't know because, look, I'm just a wrestling fan that researches some stuff. I don't No one can know everything, no matter how hard they try the old footage of Bill Mercer, again, I wish Bill Mercer had been part of this, but Bill Mercer, very underappreciated uh, wrestling commentator. Uh, had that newscaster quality about him, because I believe he was a newscaster, and presented it well, presented it like a sport. Um, and then, <laughs> they just, they talk about the various, they, they talk about the various talents here, that Chris Adams, he, he got mentioned as being a nice guy, except when he drank, he, um, I believe he went with Brian Diaz to Juarez in Mexico, picked a fight with some people. They had to run back across the border. No, they had to run back across the border to El Paso, I believe. And Brian said he punched out Chris, and Chris didn't even remember the next day because he was blackout drunk. Um, Chris was a great talent, but yeah, he didn't want him drinking. He even got involved in it, got involved in an incident in Israel where he got in a fight with a bartender, hit the super kick on him, and caused his eye to come out. So basically, um, he was told by somebody, uh, David Manning was, too many pronouns, pal, go get his passport and get him out of here or it's going to be bad. They managed to get him on the plane just before it happens. The Israeli police show up at uh, David Manning's place, his apartment, or a hotel or wherever the hell he was staying. I couldn't have been an apartment. I don't think he made residence there, but he was staying at a hotel and they couldn't get to him. But then Chris got involved in a fight on another plane, headbutting a pilot. They really made Chris seem like a goddamn piece of shit, which, I mean, I don't... If you read up stories about the guy, he wasn't necessarily the best women, but he was a great talent. But, I mean, just maybe they presented him in the right way because he had his demons. <laughs> um, and that was some pretty good stuff. I <laughs> I, did, I do uh, want to note that next week is Jim Crockett Promotions, which I'm really, really excited to see that particular episode. How um, the Von Ericks were just... The Von Ericks were absolutely revered. Kevin had the look. Carrie just, you know, had the tremendous physical charisma. And, I mean, each of them had something that Fritz had. David, he probably was most well-rounded. He could have been a guy that would have been world champion, even though Carrie was for about 18 days. Um, <clears throat> that uh, Kevin mentions how he has teeth marks in his foot to this day from um, doing a kick to Buddy in the corner. And then teeth got, you know, teeth got, like, knocked out and, like, you know, cuts and everything and all that. And says, you might want to get a tetanus shot because Buddy doesn't like to brush his teeth. Gross. And then Kevin talks about another tooth story where he had an infected tooth or a bad tooth and he pulled it out with pliers. Man. American dentistry, um, you know, system really doesn't work out all that great, does it? Even in the 80s. So anyway, the Von Eric Freebird feud, I mean, if I tried to talk about all that, we'd be here all day, but from the time where the Freebirds were, you know, brought in, and they were friends with them at first, and if I remember right, they worked together, I think, in Georgia, I think Kevin might, Kevin or David, it was one of the two, 
I'm trying to remember because, again, you know, stuff in the head. But I know that they had had interactions before, and the old footage is great to see. The old, you know, Georgia footage, Memphis footage, and then world class. And just how the Freebirds love to drink, love to do stuff. Terry Gordy breaking tables, burning furniture. So that's just what Terry Gordy did. Terry was a great guy to the people that appreciate him and if he appreciated you. But if you messed with him, he would like this one fan that said, ah, Terry's not so tough and he pushed him over the rope. Why would you stand up next to, why would you try to bow up to a guy that's six foot five, 260, 270? Like, why would you stand up to a guy that big? Who's tremendous? <laughs> Speaking of demons, unfortunately, Terry passed away, I think, in 2000, 2000, 2001. And it's a real shame. Because he was only like 40. No, oh, Gordy the 40. Hmm, okay, that didn't work. But they tell another Terry uh, Bam Bam Gordy story where he uh, wasn't happy with his car taking too long to be repaired, so he drove it off the rack, drove it through the windshield of the dealership, and pissed on the floor. Because Terry Gordy. What the, what what the fuck else is he gonna do? Michael Hayes being a hell of a talker. Christmas night, 1982. Flair versus Carey, Flairy as it were. Hayes as a special guest referee. David Manning as the uh, official referee. Terry Gordy outside the cage. And mind you, the Freebirds and the Von Erichs had all been friends to this point. <laughs> and Hayes is a little bit aggressive. It was like you know, hey, punched out Flair at one point. Carey, go cover him. No, not that way. And it's a cage match, by the way. you got to escape the cage to win. Well, they basically end up screwing over Carey because Car they did this thing where Flair knocked Carey into Hayes. Flair's out of the picture. Hayes sees him and says, hey, wait a second. Why did Carey do that to me? Okay, Terry slammed the cage door on his head. Okay. Oh, shit. There's no barricade. And there's a lot of fans here. They're really pissed off. Michael, I think we made a mistake. No, they didn't, because they drew tremendous money in 83 and into 84. Where, unfortunately, you know, David Von Erich passed away February 10th, 1984, I believe, in Japan. Just couldn't gut it out. And then we got to the Sunshine Precious, gorgeous Jimmy Garvin thing, where Sunshine was his cousin, by the way. His cousin. His actual real-life cousin. Apparently, from the way this is described. If that is true, he kissed his cousin. Gross. What the fuck? What is going on in the South? Why would you kiss your cousin? What is wrong here? Now, I'm not knocking everybody in the South. But anyway, um, she liked to drink, even drank with Buddy, so that's why Precious was brought in. The actual story is, hey, uh, Garvin was like, you know, Sunshine's making a lot, but Precious would do this for half the rate and I can get her money too. And he made the whole two women, one guy thing work. And Sunshine cut a great goddamn promo where she was just going to, I'm going to scratch your eyes out. And that little tramp gets in the way and everything. I need to find the date of that. But that's a really, really, really good promo. It didn't last long, like all that. It was just a year or maybe under. But they drew a lot of money with it. Because World Class did a lot of great trend-setting stuff. They did where Garvin and Sunshine were digging all the stuff on, you know, doing the yard work on David Von Erich's ranch. And, they, and then he wouldn't clean up the barn. And then they got in a fight in a big old shit-filled barn. And then it, from there, World Class, they <coughs> continued to... They continued to grow... Even after David's death, but the growth didn't last long because they started to go back down. But there's a final story where David Manning mentions how he chased a guy down that stole money from the box office in one of these spot shows, fired four bullets, couldn't hit him, and the clip was empty. So this guy hid behind a dirt pile, money's starting to fly everywhere, but he hits him in the face with a gun. Then the police show up, and the money's flying everywhere, so everybody's trying to gather the money, anybody with the company. And they go, well... David thinks he's going to get in trouble, so he says, I shot two, or I fired two shots in the air. He's like, why? Because they did a whole bunch of paperwork. They refilled his clip and said, don't ever go anywhere without a full clip again, because Texas. And then the Legacy World Class, closing in 1990, the USWA thing. Didn't work out. Only with Jerry Jarrett and all that, and Kevin Von Erich was the final champion, I believe. And there you go. 
Legacy World Class. Hey, it was great to see these guys on the panel. I still say Iceman King Parsons <laughs> would have been better than Chavo Guerrero Jr. That's just my uh, deal, and I'm sticking to it. But you know what? It's a pretty good episode. Pretty good episode overall. Even if a couple of these stories are kind of, you know, retreads, there was some good stuff, especially about Terry Bam Bam Gordy. So, next week, Jim Crocker Promotions. Let me know your thoughts in the comments. Like, share, subscribe, Twitter handle in the description. I'm John Rutland. I'll see you soon.